Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation is the gospel which we just heard and we will hear hear again throughout the sermon. Imagine now you're planning a trip to the amusement park with your children. But your children have never been to an amusement park before, never seen one. How can you describe it to them? The rides, the sounds, the excitement, the uh, smells, whatever. Maybe you could start with, um, describe the Ferris wheel. Oh, Ferris wheel, that's a big round circle, big, and it stands up, and then there are seats on it, on the edges, and it goes round and round. Now, by this time, it's anybody's guess what kind of picture your children are forming in their minds. It could be something completely different because they've never seen one before. So you resort to another trick or another way of describing something. It's like, uh, it's like, um, oh, remember we went to the flour mill and the water wheel that powered the mill. Ferris was kind of like that. It's bigger. And then you sit like where the water is, but you don't fall out because the seats are kind of like buckets of water. You know, if you carry a bucket of water, it doesn't matter what you do with your hand, the bucket stays level and the water doesn't spill out, right? That's the way the seats are on a Ferris wheel. Now, you might get a little ways that way. <clears throat> now, once you've been to the amusement park and everybody has seen it and experienced it, and now you don't need to use those comparisons as much anymore. You may even remember, oh, yeah, yeah, I do remember, Dad. It is kind of like that. Uh, water wheel at the flour mill. But in general, you just kind of remember. Well, Jesus had a similar problem in telling the people of his day about the love and forgiveness that God wants to give them because the grand work that he did to bring that forgiveness had not been carried out. He couldn't point to it. You know, we have an advantage now. You know, we're going to talk about Jesus' forgiveness. Oh, look, there's a cross. Jesus was taken to that cross. Some evil men nailed him to that cross. He was carrying our sins. He suffered, and then he died. And that paid for our sins and took away our sins. And then, of course, he came down. He was in a grave, and he rose again to life. Pointing to these events in history the God used to carry out our salvation, which had not been taken place in Jesus' day yet. And additionally, there's things that are simply invisible. How do you describe things that are invisible? Well, that's another reason Jesus uses parables. It's like this. In fact, you know, the whole Old Testament, which took place before Jesus suffered and died, uses a lot of pictures also. Pictures of sacrifices to show the seriousness of sin and that sacrifice is required for, for forgiveness. The festivals which uh, pictured the restored relationship with God that he gives once he has forgiven sins and, and all those laws of separation of, between sin and, and evil and, and good and holy. It's filled with pictures. And now... We have the fulfillment of that at the cross. Now today we focus on a couple of the pictures that Jesus picked, uh, parables, that show a couple aspects of how things work in God's kingdom. And he's uh, two aspects of, more specifically, of how the kingdom of God grows. So as we look at these, we're going to seek an answer to the question, How does God's kingdom grow?
Well, first, let's read from the beginning of our text. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground, and while he sleeps and rises night and day, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. The ground produces fruit on its own, first the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And when the crop is ready, he swings the sickle without delay, because the harvest has come. As always the case, Jesus picked some common things that the people would be familiar with to use in his parable. And this being an agrarian society, the use of seeds and, and how seeds grow would be a very one that all the people that were listening would understand. Now in this, <clears throat> uh, he calls attention to certain aspects of how they grow. He calls attention, first of all, in the first parable that the seed is planted, the farmer plants a seed, but after that he does nothing to cause that seed to grow. The actual sprouting, growth, producing more seeds, a crop, that's something the farmer cannot do. A good farmer knows that it is best. Once you plant the seed, just leave it. It will grow by itself. Um, in fact, you know, if you're worried, if you plant a seed, and, oh, you're worried, it's not coming up, and you dig it up to see if it's sprouting, that's not going to help. That's going to cause harm, isn't it? Or anything else you do to try to cause seed to grow. It grows on its own. Or we could even say, automatically. The Greek word here is automate, from which we get our word automatically. Now, when you think about it, it is an amazing power that God has put in every seed to be able to sprout, sprout a root going down, leaves going up, to continue to grow and to produce a crop, seeds or fruits or whatever, uh, <clears throat> all from that little seed. I grew up on a farm, and I was always amazed watching each spring my dad would plant the fields, plant the corn, and then a few days later, he'd go out and look, okay, is it up yet? Is it up yet? And then finally, one day, three, four days, or depending on how cold it was, you'd see these little green spears of corn coming up out of the ground in a nice row down the field. Or you go out in the garden, and the, corn, the, the beans that you planted, they kind of come up with a curl... Looks like they got the seed attached to them and then they grow up and be a nice plant. It's amazing. It's an amazing power that God has put into them. Uh, and there, there is work to do. Planting, cultivating. Yeah, we still did that when I was young. Uh, pest control. Finally, the harvest. But there is nothing you can do to coax a seed to sprout and grow. It's going to grow, or it's not going to grow. You can't do anything about it. But without our help, it does grow. Normally, there's rain and whatever, and produces a crop automatically. And this is the way things go in God's kingdom. Um, as in many of Jesus' parables, the seed is God's word. Now, we humans plant that seed. We speak it to other people, tell other people about God's saving acts and what he has done in history to, to save us, um, what he's done to carry out our salvation. And we may do this repeatedly. Sometimes you have to replant. But the seed, the word, has its own power to sprout and grow, to work in the heart's of the people that hear it. Uh, we can do nothing to help it grow. In that way, we are not like a salesperson. Now, a salesperson, they not only have to tell you about a product, they have to convince you, persuade you to buy this vacuum cleaner that they have just demonstrated for you. 
their livelihood depends on their ability to convince you to buy it. We, that's not our work. Our work is simply to tell about it. Perhaps it's more like the work of a teacher, where a teacher makes sure that the material is explained clearly and, and can be comprehended by the students. Because God's word, we speak it, but it, it does not work like a magic potion or a magic formula. It is received by the ears and understood and comprehended, and it is that in that way that it works. But of course, it's not just comprehended. As it's working, it changes hearts. It changes hearts, breaking down conceit into contrition, uh, changing doubt into belief, and <clears throat> bringing hope where there was despair. That's a great change that the word works in the heart as it sprouts and grows. It also brings forth more outward fruits, causing people to be more helpful and uh, concerned about other people, to be forgiving toward those who wrong you, uh, to, to put away sinful lifestyles. That's all in that work that the Word does in the heart, growing and sprouting. Now, what does this mean for us today? We can't forget that though the work of growing is God's work, there is work for us to do. Somebody has to plant the seeds to spread it. Uh, it doesn't get into the world. It doesn't get into people's ears unless somebody speaks it. God has chosen to use us human beings, his people, to spread that word, to speak it, to tell others what he has done. And that means seeking opportunities to do just that. Looking for ways that we can speak to someone and tell them about God's love and what he has done. It may be as simply, you know, simple as, as telling them how God has blessed you in this life. Um, blessed you with many earthly blessings. Maybe that he has blessed you with many beautiful, intelligent grandchildren. Oh, and children too. Um, but many blessings like that. But it also involves telling people about blessings that he has given you in forgiveness. That he's removed your load of guilt. That he's given you hope for the future. That there's a home for you waiting in heaven. Seeking an opportunity to tell people about this, that's one of the things we do to plant that seed. We do it on an individual basis, and we do it as a church. Now, you have a new or renewed opportunity now to, to do this in your church, to get together with your new pastor, to plan how we can plant the seed around us. Your new pastor will come with his years of training in the Word of God and how to use that Word. You will come with your knowledge of your community and the people around you and, and what can be done. And then you get together and plan. And how can we plant God's Word around us and work together to do this? But we do need to continue to remember that the work is done by the word that we plant, the word that's heard by the ears of those who, uh, to whom we speak it. You cannot increase the effectiveness of the word. And we might have to make sure that that word is part of our plans. We can make all kinds of plans as a church, ways to get people to hear that word, to come and hear that word, for example, uh, but we have to remember that all the potlucks in the world do not change hearts by themselves. They are only a tool. And other programs the church may use to, to draw people, it is still the Word, the seed of the Word that has that power to change hearts. And then Jesus goes on. He wants to point out another aspect of growth in God's kingdom <clears throat> as we read. The next section of our text, 
<clears throat> then he said, to what should we compare the kingdom of God? Or with what parable may we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is one of the smallest of all the seeds planted in the ground. Yet when it is planted, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, puts out large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest under its shade. Have you ever tried to plant little tiny seeds like lettuce seeds or carrot seeds? It's not easy, is it? Now, really, you probably should take each individual seed and carefully place it, uh, space it out on the row, but, you know, that's pretty impractical, isn't it? But if you take a bunch and kind of sprinkle it, then you get uneven spacing. It's all over the place. It's not, not easy to do. In fact, if you look on YouTube, you can find all kinds of videos. One I saw was take your little tiny seeds and mix them with sand, one part seeds, 100 parts sand, and then sprinkle that. So there's all kinds of ways to, to, to get that. And, and then it comes to, let's cover the seed with earth. Well, the standard procedure or the standard recommendation that I've heard is you cover it three to four diameters, three to four times the diameter of the seed. Well, for a carrot seed, how much is that? How do you get soil that thin? Um, it's not easy, but once you do get it planted, then it's amazing what that little tiny seed can do grows up big. Make a big carrot, for example, or lots of leaves of cabbage until it finally you know, bolts and goes, goes bitter. In this picture, the mustard is even more amazing because it is a very tiny seed and can grow up to be a plant 10 feet or more tall with branches that can have birds sitting in them from a little tiny seed. Now it takes 30 branches to hold up a bird and to provide shade for that bird as Jesus talks about. But God planned it this way. He put that power in that seed to do this, to grow up and to be a big, majestic plant. Again, this is not a farming lesson or a gardening lesson. Jesus is teaching us something about the power of his word, again pictured with the seed. Here he's pointing to how the word grows extensively into a big kingdom. Now at the time Jesus spoke this parable, there were a lot of people gathering around Jesus, supposedly wanting to hear him, many wanting to have him heal them. But in fact... During his day, the number of people that actually believed his message was quite small. By the time of his death and resurrection, a few hundred at best. Then, Pentecost Day, it was that amazing day when 3,000 people were baptized. But that's still a small number in a city of Jerusalem, which could have been up to 100,000 people uh, in that day. Um, it's really hard to get estimates all over the place as to how big Jerusalem was. But still, 3,000 people in the city is still a very small amount. But it would grow. And Jesus told his disciples, you just have to be patient and wait. That seed will cause it to grow. And the disciples, none of the disciples lived long enough to see Christianity become the official religion of the Roman Empire. But during their day, even under much persecution, during their lifetime, they were able to see the church spread as far as Spain to India. Thomas got to India. Um, Paul and maybe others got to Spain and all the places in between. That's quite amazing in that short period of time. And they, <clears throat> that all came from the power of the seed and from that small beginning in Jerusalem. Again, we are reminded of the power in the seed of God's word. The church has spread throughout the whole world. There's no place in the world where the church does not exist at least a little bit. Probably no country where there are no Christians to be found, some very few and they have to be uh, underground and, and hidden. 
other places where there's a church almost in every village, but it has grown greatly. We need to you know, let God's word work. Get that word out, spread it, plant it, speak it, so that it can go. Now, just add a little note here. There's another reason, at least one more reason, that Jesus used these parables uh, to tell how things work in his kingdom. Many people had false ideas about the kingdom, about uh, the, the kingdom of God and what the Messiah was to come to do. In fact, the disciples themselves, even after his resurrection, still had false hopes about what they thought Jesus would do. And most of those hopes centered around some kind of earthly events, some uh, political change that would make things so much better in this world that maybe Jesus would gather an army and he would go to battle and, and win the victory and march to the streets of Jerusalem as the victor and establish a wonderful kingdom on this earth. Of course, that's not what he came to do. And so Jesus' parables here of the seed growing, which is a very slow, quiet, almost secretive process that you hardly you can't even see happening day to day. That's the way things work in, in God's kingdom. God's ruling activity in the hearts of his people, it grows in there. And it grows perhaps slowly, but powerfully and certainly. And <clears throat> it changes people's hearts to produce fruits of, of love and harmony, kindness and generosity. And these parables help emphasize that over against other ideas of what uh, <clears throat> people may have thought. Now, those ideas of earthly blessings and greatness coming out of God's kingdom are still around today among some Christians. They look forward to outward signs of, of God's grace or Jesus' work in this world and in their lives. They want a miraculous healing for their disease. They want God to give them the perfect spouse uh, they want God to give them prosperity and wealth and maybe power and influence. Um, now, God does give blessings like that. He apportions them to his people as he sees is best for them. But this is not the important thing of God's kingdom. It's that work in our hearts that changes our hearts to be repentant of our sins, to recognize our sins, to confess them, and to receive the forgiveness he's prepared in Jesus Christ for us, to, to move us to acts of, of love and kindness and forgiveness to the people around us. That is the important work of God's kingdom in this world. The parables of this seed that Jesus used to explain these things, God's kingdom growth, to the people of his day are still useful for us today, even after Jesus has come and suffered and died and risen again. We still use them to, to help us understand. Even as we look in the Old Testament, in those sacrifices and ceremonies, they can still be helpful for us to understand the picture of, of God's grace for us. Now, perhaps you've noticed we have not really fully answered the question we started with, have we? How does God's kingdom grow? In fact, we really can't. It's like, how does a seed grow? Even science today really doesn't have a full handle on that, nor do we have on how God's kingdom grows, because God does that work. It's his work. Nevertheless, we've seen some aspects of how that growth takes place. Uh, <clears throat> we learn how God's kingdom grows automatically. When that word is, is preached, and spoken to people to change their hearts, changed our hearts. And it produces fruits in our lives, produces a harvest. And it grows to be a big kingdom. It grows extensively. And so, praise the Lord for how he grows his kingdom among us. Amen. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.